With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, he's one of our favorites. We've just never had to call him this before because he was working under his gimmick, the artist formerly known as Jericho Hill, Stephen Popick, uh, an economist at one of those four-letter, not three-letter uh, places of government. I don't know. Should we say malfeasance, fiscal fortitude? What do you say? What do you call those kind of organizations where it's a bunch of letters and a lot of government money? Um, great employment. Great employment. Well, good work if you can get it, as they would say in the business. Uh, great to see you, buddy. He uh, had been writing anonymously. Some things happened in his life. He is now out. And I got exposed. a couple of publications that uh, raised the profile a bit, so I decided that it was time to uh, take on a new name. Yep, and he's got a very high-profile thing we're going to talk about on some future episode just as soon as the legal stuff gets cleared up. We'll get to that hopefully in a couple of weeks. My uh, friend, oh, spoiler, spoiler alert, I think we're going to be cleared up. Good deal. I can't wait. Let, tease it, tease it, tease it. Don't, 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 don't give away the ending just yet. Over um, the summer, I had the opportunity to uh, serve as a testifying expert in a, in a trial. Yeah, I can't wait to get into that with you, too. We'll get you back on that pretty soon. But let's go to your Ballywick. Let's talk some economics the cpi came out let's start with the nomenclature because everybody freaked out um a lot of people got a lot of clicks and notice over it i just took the little um first page reading of it and i just read it straight on this program because i thought that was the fairest way to do it because i thought it was actually pretty concise and pretty easy to understand if you just read the press release now the actual report's like 27 pages of pdf so that's a little more detailed tell people what this is why it matters and what it does as far as it goes to inflation yeah, so the, that, I think that's great, Andrew. And I think it's nice to say that, yeah, the CPI press release that the BLS puts out is, is designed to be understandable for non-geeky numbers people like me. So we we were hoping that CPI would fall. Um, we were hoping that the gas prices uh, and other energy changes and some of these other supply chain issues working themselves out would Finally, we'd see those pressures that we've been seeing building to, you know, push the CPI down and it would get pushed down. And the good news is that, yeah, the things that we expected to push it down were pushing the CPI down. The sort of want, want moment uh, is that shelter costs really started to drive the CPI going up and the, the changes in shelter costs, that, that's your housing, that's your rent were large enough that they overwhelmed the good news from, say, gas prices falling. So we actually saw that inflation uh, essentially was unchanged. It rose just slightly on a year-over-year -year basis. And just to complete the picture, the most concerning item that I'm seeing in the CPI right now is that from March to July, we were watching what we call core CPI. That's the CPI after we subtract out food cost and energy cost. And we subtract those out because those are very volatile, right? Gas prices can go up and down because OPEC does something, you know? Uh, food prices can go up and down because there's a salmonella outbreak somewhere. So we were seeing these, these the CPI, less food and energy, what we call core CPI, going down. And it was doing that in July, so we were hoping and expecting to see core CPI continue to decline in August, and then we could start popping champagne. And that's not what happened. Core CPI actually had a pretty decent-sized jump. So headline inflation went down, driven by energy and gas prices. But core, that not volatile section, reversed the trend of declining and started and has now gone back up. That that's really disappointing for someone like me who thought that you know. We really should be getting over this hump now. We Let's put this in the context because we've been talking about the COVID stuff a lot. It's like what is involved there, what's not involved there. And then, of course, we talk about, you know, things that are outside of our control, like the war in Ukraine that Russia perpetrated against the Ukrainian people that they're now getting their butt kicked in. Thank God. Our friend Joey Politano actually put a really good chart together on this. And I'm going to link to this chart. So for the radio audience, though, I'm going to I'm going to 
explain it, but we'll put it on the screen for the YouTube folks. The pandemic prices, food, energy, core goods, core services, the four kind of big important things in your life, right? You can see on this chart, 2000, when the pandemic really bit, energy went through the floor. Of course, nobody's going anywhere, so energy prices go down. Um, core goods, the prices actually went down a little bit. Of course, not people aren't buying as much because they're not going out as much. Food prices were pretty level, and that all stayed pretty in line with before the, the pandemic. And then in spring of 2021, so the last 18 months really is what we're talking here, it just starts climbing. And energy is a big chunk of that. The food cost is a big chunk of that. The core goods is a big chunk of that. And then the core services underneath all that. You touched on it briefly, but the number that really threw everybody off was, is they're like, well, the energy cost is going to go down. That should bring everything else down. Well, the energy did tick down, but the food still went up and the core goods still went up and the core services still went up. And that's the problem here that's got everybody in a loop on this metric, isn't it? And and we're also looking at a rail strike happening in a few days, Andrew. Amtrak just came out and announced that they're basically shutting down their operations outside of the Northeast Corridor. We know it's going to affect freight prices, and uh, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but a lot of our goods move on freight, right? Maybe we forget that, but there's a lot of freight. Yeah, and I'm a transportation guy by trade, so I know that the intermodal ports are actually already shutting down because they have to cover what's called surge time. Uh, so they're already shutting down because they only got so much room to store stuff. So that this is like every every time like we think that we're getting through this thing, right? Something else pops up and you just sort of reset it again. It's very, very frustrating. You know, especially from those policy protections. Like, you know, you couldn't predict that we we're going to have this railroad strike happen. You know, that's going to affect food and it's going to affect appliance costs and other, and other sort of durable uh, goods items, right? Right. Now, this does blast a hole in one running narrative is like, well, this is all gas prices. I know when you've been on here before, you pointed to, well, it's energy prices and used cars are the kind of the two that you were looking at. Well, here that's not holding up now because now the energy prices are going down. Used car prices actually ticked down a little bit, which is good because they were the highest they've ever been in recorded history. It was very, very high. Both of those have gone down. That's not what's fueling the food and cost of living increases. So no. what is pushing it then? Well, um, some would say wages, right, uh, would be translating to that. And certainly if, if the price of labor is going up, that would cause uh, the price of goods to go up. Uh, I think it still seems that we're not out of our supply chain issues at all. So I, I think that that is still driving the, the price of these goods up, um, you know, and you know, we are still emptying our pocketbooks from the surplus of spending that we got uh, from the pandemic, right? And that amount of cash was flush in consumers' pockets, and folks had pretty good vibes about the uh, about their personal economy, not the national economy, but the personal economy. So they were spending, uh, and that helped drive things. That that helps drive costs up as well, you know. And then, you know, so I still think that those will shake out over time. And they should, but I think over time I need to now instead of thinking months, I might be talking a year or two. So I, I kind of have to own uh, a forecasting failure here, um, and at least own up to my mistake. Like, well, nope, this inflation is going to last a little bit longer than, than I thought. By a little bit, I mean a year or two longer. And it, it's a bitter pill to swallow when you're an economist and you get something like that wrong. But own right. your mistakes. You're more credible if you do. Yeah, but the thing is, like we said, you've got data points now. So like, well, we thought energy prices was driving a lot of this. The energy prices changed. Everything else didn't change. That's a data point. Um, oh, by the way, yeah, Joey, so Joey Pal Pal Palatano, uh, Palatano. He, he writes for uh, it's Apricitas, A-P-R-I-C-I-T-A-S, for those watching, you know, listening. Um, and he's, his sub stack is well worth uh, the free subscription. And I would say it's worth the paid subscription, too. And uh, he's now a free man to uh, to talk a lot about this stuff. And um, if there isn't a rising star uh, below the age of 30 in, in economics that isn't named Joey, I don't know who it is. Yeah, uh, we've already reached out to him. He's going to be coming on the show real soon. We're working that out. 
Um, thanks to your recommendation, by the way. Let's go through some of these numbers real quick because, again, this is a stats-heavy thing, so you need to explain it to us. Uh, we talked about what the chart looks like. Here's the actual numbers on it. I'm just going to go through these individually. You give me your comments on them. Mm -hmm. um, most of this is year over year, so that kind of makes it understandable. So it's like, okay, this is the last 12 months compared to this time last year, yep. right? All right, increases. This is directly from the economic news release. So this isn't spin. This isn't somebody's opinion. This is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Increases in shelter, food, and medical care indexes were the largest of many contributors to the broad-based monthly all-items increase. These increases were mostly offset by a 10.6% decline in the gasoline index. That's the energy we were talking about. The food index, now this is the one everybody's going to be talking about, continue to rise, increasing 0.8% over the month as the food at home index rose 0.7%. The energy index fell 5% over the month as the gas index declined, but the electricity and natural gas indexes increased. Those are a lot of big words and numbers. What does that say to you? What it, I mean, really what it comes down to is, one, I, so the food thing is a little bit shocking. Again, you know, I was expecting for that to be resolving itself. It tells me that our economy has not figured out how to function post-COVID. It tells me that we're still dealing with a lot of the shocks that, that we had Began with the COVID economy, uh, and that quite frankly, we're going to get poor inflation readings probably for the rest of the year. That, that's my bottom. I mean, remember, I used to be pretty positive a few months ago, so I, I'm changing my tune a little bit. I'm a little bit disappointed. I don't see inflation shooting out of control or anything like that, but I think we're going to see inflation stay uncomfortably high. And the takeaway that everybody should have from that is what is the Federal Reserve going to do? Well, um, I think the floor is a 75 basis point increase at their next meeting. That's going to raise the cost of borrowing for everybody. It's going to translate into higher mortgage prices in some respects. It's going to translate to a lot of other higher prices, um, you know, higher higher costs for for those for those items. So, you know, they're going to Federal Reserve is going to you know we were hoping that maybe they would start tapering off their their rate increases, um, right? Because they're trying to do the soft landing. They're trying to bring a plane down. Uh, and land it without a whole lot of landing gear. Uh, basically, some of their, you know, that, that land is about to get a little bit rougher. It's going to be even more difficult to pull off that soft landing. Can they still do it? Yeah, they can. Is, are there some data points in favor of them? Yes, there are. But there's there's definitely a mounting number of data points that are saying it's going to be a lot more difficult. Yeah, there was some good news in here. Airfares were good. Uh, it was a massive travel year, which everybody kind of assumed it would be coming out of COVID. Everybody wanted to get out and move. It's been a really good tourism and travel year economically for folks. So airfares were good. Communication, that one was kind of interesting. But again, coming off of COVID, everybody kind of changed communication. You figured that would do okay. Then the indicator you've been talking about ever since we started bringing you on the program, used cars and trucks declined. That was a big one because that was one that you called a pressure point kind of a thing of, listen, when the economy's bad, used cars and trucks get really expensive because people are trying to get the cheaper one because they can't afford the new one. That's your data point. That's the one you always told us to look at. Now that one actually looks good underneath all these bad numbers. What does that tell you? Well, it's starting to look better. It's still well above what we consider normal inflation for the year over year change. For example, right? The, uh, the used cars that Andrew's mentioning, they went down by 0.4 percentage points in July, month over month. And in August, they went down 0.1 percentage points month over month, um, going leading us to a, a, uh, a year over year change from August to August of 7.8 percentage points. That is still high. You know, it's going to it's going to take a lot of downward movement in used cars to get you back to the baseline of where that would seem to be reasonable. You know, keep in mind, we were coming off of May and June where used car prices month over month rose 1.8 and 1.6%. 0 0.1 declines ain't going to get you that much down. Yeah. Talking to our buddy, Stephen Popick. He is an economist. He's a good friend of ours. We always love talking to him. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to keep digging into these numbers. Uh, we're going to dig into the reaction to him. There's a couple reactions out there in the news media and social media that caught his attention. One of them's got him all kinds of fired up because he's like, send me this and ask me this, which is very unusual for him. So we're going to get into that more with Stephen Papak. We're Listen, this stuff is hard, and he explains it so well that even I understand it. We're going to keep doing that right after the break. Heard tell continues.
Hi, uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. We got our buddy Stephen Popick with us. He's an economist. He's got all them fancy letters after his name, but he explains things really, really common sense wise, especially things that get loud on the internet, like when the CPI report comes out, like inflation, like economics. We love having him on. Um, let's talk about the reaction here because there was some of the narratives out of this that you just didn't care for. Um, this is actually out of the Census Bureau data, but it came out about the same time as the Labor and Bureau statistics. So they were kind of pancaking two things together here. Um, I won't use the name because I don't want to call one person out because I saw four different people had this exact same take on this. But the idea was that the U.S. middle class is, quote unquote, disappearing. And they said the higher income group shared household earnings goes went 100,000 plus is what we're talking about, tripled between 67 and 2001. Middle income households decreased and low-income households increased. Just to correct you, it's from 1967 to 2021, not 2021. 2000. Yeah, 2021, excuse me. I'm I'm time-shifted. I still think it's last year. My bad. Is the middle class decreasing, disappearing, whatever you want to call it, or is people fiddling with the numbers here and getting a narrative where there shouldn't be one? So, I mean, the numbers are right. We did have only 12% or so of households making a hundred thousand or more dollars, and that's in twenty twenty one dollars. So this this is this is inflation adjusted, right? Making uh, the equivalent of a hundred thousand dollars today back in nineteen sixty seven, and we see thirty six percent of those, uh, thirty six percent of households are making a hundred thousand dollars more in twenty twenty one, and we see that you know when they define low income using the same metric and putting it all twenty twenty one dollars, that the percentage for low income you know has changed a little bit. But really, the decline has been in the middle income bracket. 55% were middle income in 1967, down 39% in 2021 on households. Now, yes, that's that's technically true, but the devil's in the details. And the detail is simply this, and I put it out there to, to, to Andrew when they said this. I said, wow, they have discovered that women started to work during the 60s, 70s, and 80s because you can look at the decline in the or the the decline in the middle class that they have the, the that these folks define, and put the mirror image of women's labor force participation rising during that time. And since you're talking about household income, you're seeing the transition from a one male dominated single family uh, you know, income to a joint family. You know, two workers. You know, husband wife. You know, cohabitating couples. You know, whatever, um, working together. So congratulations to these folks. Uh, you're saying the middle class is shrinking because women started working. I'm not sure that's the right message to have in an election year. Yeah, you pulled the numbers up from Fred. Um, so 1967 is the number they want to work on. Uh, women labor force participation rate was in the low 40s in 1967, depending on which number you want to use. By the by 2010, it was bumping around 60%. It dropped down a little bit during the 2000s. And then in 2020, something really interesting happened. In the spring of 2020, all of a sudden, the wom women participation in the labor force dropped almost nine percentage points in a month. Did anything important happen in February, March, April of 2020 that might have precipitated that number there, economist? Absolutely nothing happened. Nope, nope. I didn't start working from home at that point. We weren't all scared about a, a pandemic going on. Uh, Schools didn't close. Daycares didn't no, no, Nothing happened. <laughs> of course, we're talking about that's when COVID restrictions hit. Everybody started staying home. Children had to be home. Uh, of course, that hit especially working mothers hard and multi-parent households changed quite a bit. By the way, that number still has not come. We've talked about things that have bounced back since COVID. That number's not back to pre-pandemic level. It's still off by about 4 or 5%, something to kind of keep an eye on as we're looking at these other numbers. Okay, back to the CPI for just a second. Because this is the number that everybody probably feels the most acutely. It's it's weird for something like Bureau and Labor Statistics to have kind of a uh, a one liner in a press release, but boy, this one had a little bit of punch to it. They said the food index increased eleven percent over last year, and it was already way way up. We're talking about um, you know a massive raise already, the largest twelve month increase since the period ending in May of 1979. Put that in perspective, folks, I'm not even in utero yet. That's before I was even made, let alone born. That's a long time. People that don't remember, the late 70s was not exactly economic nirvana. That's a bad number and a bad comp to have on an official government release, yeah? 
Well, first off, I just discovered that uh, I'm just slightly older than uh, than Andrew here, uh, because I believe I was in utero at that time. <laughs> Problem uh, for the Popic family. Uh, something like that. Um, yeah, look, like some of this, like we did sort of expect, like you can't have a war go on in the breadbasket that basically feeds Eastern Europe and almost all of North Africa and expect for that not to have implications for worldwide food markets. You know? Um, and that's part of the, that, that's part of, of this issue. But, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, I think, I think we're seeing that farms are still having supply chain issues. We've had a pretty big drought out West where there's a lot of farming activity. Um, that's going to raise the price of crops over there. And spoiler, that kind of drought activity probably ain't going away anytime soon. Um, you know, that, that, that's just going to be a problem. So that's where we get a lot of our crops out there. So yeah. Um, those things together, you know, that explains part of why we've seen such high costs. And you can also think of like food costs might have been that some of this increase could be a lag because food prices had to adjust. And we know that energy prices spiked a few months ago. You got to get that food somewhere that costs energy, that costs gas. And so those those prices are obviously passed on, but you can't immediately raise prices, right? Uh, you can't you can't adjust that perfectly once once these prices of energy rise. You have to sort of do it in response to it a month later or two months. So some of that could be the fact that we saw food prices spike because we saw energy prices spike a few months ago. And so this is just things working its way through the system, contracts that could sign to to ship stuff out that were signed three months ago that are now being, you know, actually, you know, enacted, right? Because, you know, nobody, nobody says, can you ship, you know, a million tons of grain, you know, without having a contract set up, you know, nine, 90 days beforehand, right? That would be bad. Um, so that could be part of what we're seeing, but it is disappointing. And yeah, uh, everybody consumes food. So, you know, not everybody is, uh, you know, uh, ha- needs to buy a car, but everybody's got to eat. You know, and I, I think I just, Again, we still have to caution, though, like there are about, you know, there are still very big differences in how Americans are experiencing inflation. Again, if you're a homeowner and if you're a white collar worker and you're getting to work from home a bit more than you used to, your personal inflation rate is definitely well below the national level that, that that's being reported. But if you're a working class person that has to drive, uh, has to, you know, buy food, you know, not, you know, and, and maybe you have to go to McDonald's or, or you, you, you have to just buy the prepackaged stuff at the grocery store um, and you're still, you know, putting miles on your car and things like that. Um, yeah, you're, you're, seeing, you're, you're seeing more inflation. You're seeing higher than the national average there. So let's just be mindful that, you know, there, there is a difference of experience, you know, that Americans are having. And I think that for folks that are thinking about, you know, what this means, I think you should try to think about putting yourself into the shoes of someone that is got a different job and in a different life than you, because they're going to be really thinking about things differently. And maybe that helps us bridge a little bit of the divide if we think about it like that. Last time we talked to you, uh, we were both hopeful that inflation was easing. Maybe we'd seen the worst of it. Um, what do these numbers do? Because like you said, some of these are going to be lagging indicators. Energy is always a lagging indicator. So this is really energy stuff from two, three months ago that we're seeing on this report. That food number, though, um, again, let's go back to the CPI for a second. What went up in these reports was shelter, medical care, household furnishing operations, vehicles, insurance, like those are the big ticket items in people's lives. Is there a danger that maybe we didn't see the plateau? Maybe this is going to have another bump or two up before we get done with it now? I think what I'd say to that is I don't have a bloody clue right now where this is going. I was convinced that we were getting over the hump. Um, I, I Push come to shove right now, Andrew. What I'm thinking is that We've got several more months of this thing sorting itself out. And so we'll probably continue to see some uncomfortably high prints. And we'll probably see the Federal Reserve continue to to raise their 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 federal funds rate 
to try to stamp out that this inflation. Um, you know, they're basically trying to lessen business activity and, and lessen demand so that that sort of reduces money in the system. And that means that, you know, prices would come down or prices would remediate. Um, and essentially, they're, they're going to have, I mean, the, the risk for the Federal Reserve is that they do too much and they trigger a recession caused by their own actions, right? And that's five out of six times when the Federal Reserve has tried to engineer a soft landing in the last, you know, recessionary crises that we've had. Uh, they failed, and they triggered a recession. You um, just you just mentioned it, so let me ask you real quick. Two terms that we're starting to hear get thrown around a lot by economists and commentators about the current situation, especially since it's volatile, like you said. At least you, at least you said you didn't have a bloody clue. Usually you shrug and say Wu-Tang, so I appreciate you giving me a little bit more of a technocratic answer there. Um, money velocity of the dollar, how much the money's moving around. And cash buying power of the dollar is two things we're hearing a lot of underneath a lot of this other stuff right now. Is that something folks should be concerned at, or is that just kind of chatter under the noise? Turn the noise down on those kind of matters for us. I think if there's like primary and secondary levels of concern, that's probably a tertiary concern for everybody. You know, I mean, the, the kitchen table issues are what most folks should be should be more concerned about. Um, you know, as you said, it was a great year to travel. Um, it's still a great year. To, it's still a great time to travel to Europe right now. We, we're seeing the euro is on par or essentially on par with the dollar. That's not normally the case. European vacations are really cheap right now for us. So, um, you know, if you have the ability to do it, you should. Now, of course, not many people do. Um, or some people don't, right? You know, significant swaths. So we should be mindful of that. That's kind of like, yay, thanks. You, you gave me something I can't use. You know, I, 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 um, I struggle for words given that I, I what used to be part of team trans, transitory inflation. And, you know, it seems that this is just stuck around for a while. So I think the biggest thing that we need to watch is how investors and the, and the market as a whole respond to the words and actions of Chairman Powell and how they try to navigate it um, to engineer a softer landing where we don't have what he's trying to do is get inflation to come down without a huge uptick in the unemployment rate, which really, of course, hurts people a lot more than I think inflation does, right? At least you still have a job. At least money's still coming in. But, you know, that this is the tricky part. You have to slow down the economy, but you don't want to slow it down so much that you trigger a recession. And, and Powell's trying to be, you know, trying to do something that's only been successful one of the last six times. Not a good standard to base off of. Uh, real quick, We've talked the economic side. There is, of course, the political side of this. The next batch of numbers we're going to get, we're going to get the end of the fiscal year numbers right as we go to vote here. Uh, early voting is actually going to be starting here before people even really realize it here. Politically. Nobody, nobody cares about fiscal numbers. Deficit spending is here to stay. Let's just everybody be real on that. <laughs> Are you done now? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but seriously, though, I, I take your point, but... You know, the, the economy is going to be the number one issue, especially the, this cost of living stuff isn't going to be fixed by the next batch of numbers. It's just not there. Even even if you had a record change down, it would still be high politically. How much both ways now, you know, how much does the reporting affect the economy and how much is the election going to affect these economic numbers? Because the economy is going to react to the election, whichever way it goes. Right. Usually does. Yeah. I think that, though, the economy is going to basically I mean, I think, the you know, the reaction to the election. The White House isn't changing this time around. There's no election for the White House, right? It's either it's Congress. And there's not a scenario on the books where Republicans get 60 senators, right? And so we're still going to be in a land where there's a Senate, you know, I assume with the with the, with the filibuster so that, you know, the normal spending routine is, is going to be continuing. There's no threat of like massive cuts of government spending. There's no threat of massive changes in government programs. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's probably going to mediate sort of any sort of e econ reaction. Most, most, most folks are pricing in right now, a Republican house uh, and a Senate that's either 49 Dems, 50 Dems or 51 Dems. You take your pick, which one of those it is, but practically speaking, they're all the same thing. Now, are you daring to say that congressional gridlock is good for the economy? I have a political philosophy that's my personal belief that divided government is good government. 
Um, I'm not I'm not against it in principle, but there's some specifics I need to know before I jump into that end of the pool. You understand? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, yeah. I just generally think like the if you have divided government, the worst of the worst ideas can't possibly get across the desk to the president to be signed, and that if you have fully unitary government of one party, really bad ideas could get across the desk to the president to sign. Yeah. Unless you have a pandemic and then they just jam through all kinds of stuff. But we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, Stephen Popek, we love having you on. You make this stuff really understandable. Looking forward to getting you on on some other topics we're gonna, we've are gonna we been talking to you about. We'll get you back on. Uh, until then, let folks know where they can follow you under your real name now. You're still under the same handle on well, Twitter, but you've got a few other things in the fire now that you're out in the public and you're all out and famous and such. Don't forget us, the little people. Until we see you again on Hurt Tell, let folks know where they can find you. Very, very, very tiny famous. Uh, you can find me as Moto Economist on, on Twitter, and you can look up my research on mortgage lending that's now available. Uh, you can, if you look up Stephen Popic uh, at Mortgage, you'll see one of my most recent research papers that looks at whether or not there's still differences in the mortgage market uh, between minority and non-minority borrowers. And spoiler alert, we still see some. We don't learn anything, do we? The same life is a circle. We keep going around and around and around. A flat circle of that. Stephen Pavic, love having you, buddy. Talk again soon, sir. You too, sir. Bye-bye. Bye.